Welcome back, everyone. I would like to introduce uh, the keynotes of the next session. And first of all, I would like to welcome Jeff Wang, and Michael will say more about it, and of course, Michael Picarillo. And I know Michael, Michael is a veteran in his field. So if you really want to learn about it, you need to be with him. And we got to know each other when uh, Michael was uh, still in California working for Nuvasiv. Lots of experience how to deal with KOLs on a daily basis. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marianne. Well, um, Michael Petrillo, I would like to talk to you about key opinion leaders. Over the last 18 years, I've been working with for profits and non profits. So you just heard from Marianne, Nuvasive, the third uh, biggest uh, spine uh, surgery company. Uh, I've worked on different programs, but obviously uh, KOL engagement programs, and that's what over the last, the latter few years I've been working on is how to engage, how to build KOL programs. And today I'm just going to go through some ideas that I have. Um, and part of that is going to talk to actually uh, Dr. Jeff Wong, who is a global uh, KOL. But to, to start with, I sometimes talk about KOLs, everybody throws out the idea of KOL and everybody tosses the name KOL out so often uh, because most people say, oh, if this is a user of our product, then they're a KOL. And actually what I want to try and show today and talk with Jeff about is that's not necessarily the right approach. A KOL is very different uh, to just being a big user. So what is a KOL? Well, I know this is pretty straightforward. They're recognized experts in their uh, specialist fields. Uh, they're pioneers of new treatments. But what I want to focus on is they're also gatekeepers for technologies. And what I mean by that, um, everybody wants to talk about, we need to find a KOL to work with us. And they sometimes ignore other KOLs who are not working. And one of the things I've learned is if you ignore everybody who you're not working with, they actually can work against you. So it's always important that even if you're working with a KOL, you also recognize those KOLs who you're not working with and you still talk to them because actually you don't want them talking negatively about your products. You want them at least neutral. So KOLs, who they are, very important. So for me, ultimately, they are change agents. They generate new knowledge and they distribute new knowledge. And if you do it correctly, they actually help you facilitate and accelerate your market penetration. It sounds obvious, but that's the whole goal of it. And when I say do it correctly, I'm saying that if you actually get the KL working in the right way and you have a real KOL management strategy, that KOL is going to help you in a one-to-many communication. And that's what you're after. And it doesn't always happen straightforwardly. Just assuming that you're working with a KOL doesn't mean to say you're going to get this distribution of your message and your product. So there's an art, ladies and gentlemen, there's an art to how to work with a KOL. Why engage with KOLs? Well, it's obviously self-explanatory. Uh, but again, I would start, like to say that it's not about them using your product, which is often the case. Everybody says, I want the KOL to use my product. Actually, that's not necessarily the best scenario. A KOL is there really for their views and opinions, to attract other experts, to open doors, obviously. But actually, they should help you create a disruptive change and build credibility and personality for your programs. But the biggest thing I'm asking my KOLs when I'm working with them is actually to challenge my company's perspective. And what I mean by that is I don't want a KOL who just necessarily agrees with what we're doing, but actually challenges back and drives us to new goals. So on that, I would like to introduce Jeff Wong, MD. He's a spine surgeon, a true global KOL. He's a professor in, of clinical orthopedic and neurosurgery uh, at Kirk, Kirk uh, Hospital in uh, the University of South uh, California. I've known Jeff now for oh, a good 15 odd years, and he's been the chairman of AO Spine and the president of the North American Spine Society, which basically means he's been the head of two of the largest 
spine groups in the world. He's also been the president of the Cervical Spine Research Society and the president of the Brain Mapping uh, Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics. And what I'd like to do is just pose a few questions to Jeff before he rushes off to another operation. And I'm hoping that these questions will be, or questions are valuable for you to know when you're thinking about how to engage a KOL. So starting with how did a KOL influence your thoughts and behaviors in the past, Jeff? Uh, so, so thanks. Uh, I, I can tell you that KOLs have been a, a big part of my career and my life. I think what, um, from your perspective, what, what you probably understand is that this is how we make connections. And so obviously there, there are people we work with and we have our mentors when we're going through training, but when we're in practice, we really kind of develop relationships and we go to meetings and scientific things, or if we're working on certain projects. And I can tell you, there have been several KOLs where I've developed personal relationships with, and we've gotten involved in activities outside of whatever activity where we initially got introduced. Uh, sometimes that leads to great opportunities. Uh, I can say that through different KOLs, I, I started with many societies on committees and had, had been able to rise through sort of the leadership of those societies. Uh, the other thing is that you get a lot of life lessons. You, you know, there's no education for us. I guess we can go get our MBAs, uh, but as far as if you're as a practicing surgeon, I don't go out and get any formal education other than what's knowledge for my surgeries. But I can tell you that through other KOLs, you develop a personal relationship. Um, you sort of ask them about life and, and you become, you develop a sort of a friendship. There's this uh, sort of, I, I think there's this mix between a friendship and being a colleague. And that's sort of that professional friendship or relationship, which is very valuable in any person's career. Thanks, Jeff. The next question I would like to know is, how should a company, a young company, a startup company, as many of these, how should they approach you or pitch to you to become an advisor? Yeah, so uh, I, I would say the, the most, one of the most important things is to do your homework. Um, there's nothing that's kind of a big turnoff for someone that comes up and they really don't understand what's going on. And what I mean by that is, uh, uh, I'll be, uh, I, I can give you some examples. I was uh, president of the North American Spine Society. And so I was at the meeting, I was involved in everything. I was giving my presidential address. And then uh, I, I go to the exhibit hall and there's a company a guy that approaches me and they start talking to me and they're like, oh, have you been at the meeting? And I'm like, you know, they're just completely unaware. They, they've obviously been focused in the exhibit hall. They have no idea of what else is going on in the meeting. They have no idea of what I'm involved in. I think the thing that really hits the mark with me are people that do their homework. They know me, they know my background, they know my interests and they come in and I don't have to explain to them like I've been involved in this society and this society. Uh, the people that are prepared and have done their homework are, are the ones that kind of resonate with me. I think the other thing that um, I really appreciate and I think we would all appreciate in our professional careers is clear, concise communication um, that you, you don't, I guess I would liken it to a sales pitch. Even if they're not selling me on a product, if they're trying to sell me on maybe working with them or selling me on a project, um, you can sort of see that th right through that. And I think people automatically kind of go to what they're comfortable with. And if you're a salesman, you start selling something, even if it's not a product, it's something else. Um, I, I just like clear, concise communication. Um, I, I, I think people have less time. And so you have to use that time wisely. You have to communicate your goals, kind of what you're interested in. Uh, I can look back and say, well, this company, I've talked to them twice and I still don't understand what they want. I still don't understand what their concept is, what their vision is. I just happen to have talked to them twice, uh, as opposed to another company where I say, yeah, I've only met them one time, but I know exactly what they want. I know exactly what they expect. And I know exactly where I stand with them. Uh, and so, so for me, it's about communication and respecting my time. I, I, I'm going to come to the respecting your time later on, but you're, I think you're bang on. So maybe you've covered some of this, but if you're going to join a company's advisory board or whatever, what, what are the expectations that you have of a company from an uh, advisory board perspective? Yeah, a, a clear message with clear goals and a vision. Um, and then I want them to be on the mark. I, I think um, they, they have to have something that interests me. Um, I don't want to join an advisory board just to join an advisory board. Um, 
nowadays, whenever I give a talk, whenever I'm at a meeting or I have to moderate a session, I have to give my disclosures. And so I, every time I work with a company, I, I disclose that. And for me, to, to, to put that disclosure on my slides, every time I give a talk, that disclosure has to mean something to me. And so when I work with a company, I guess I expect what I would call fair compensation. And I don't mean it monetarily. It can be academically, it can be intellectually, it can be something I'm just fascinated in, something that I just wanna be involved in. Uh, it can have very little monetary or no value, but it can have great intellectual interest for me, but it has to be spot on. It has to be worthwhile enough for me so that when I list that on my disclosures, I sit there and say, yes, I'm proud of that relationship. And this is what I do with that relationship. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to necessarily be, be, be monetary. It has to just be something that I enjoy doing. I, I think that um, when you talk about fair compensation, it can mean many things besides money. But you also have to understand what your uh, KOL wants. I mean, people are at different stages of their career. Um, I, I'm a little, I guess I would say more experienced. I'm a little older in my career. So I've been through so many things that right now I'm, I'm interested in, in projects that fascinate me, fa things that I'm excited about. Whereas maybe someone younger in their career um, may, may be interested in just getting out there, getting exposure, giving talks, being associated with a company and trying to develop something just because they want to get their name out there. Um, you have to look at the stage of the career and kind of figure out what fits best with that key opinion leader. Thanks, Jeff. Well, my last question, you've actually covered one, you know, where you mentioned the, the sales rep or whoever at a Congress who doesn't know that you happen to be the president of the uh, society. Right? And I've seen that happen. I've been with you in a Congress and I've seen that happen. But what other things actually turn you off from working with a company? Uh, other so specific things. There are a lot of turnoffs. Um, uh, Overpromising. Um, saying that you're going to have this clear project with goals and you don't meet those goals or, or you do follow ups and, and every time due to some manufacturing thing or some design thing or just some delays, you sit there and say, this has been delayed, this has been delayed. And I think we all understand that delays can happen. Uh, but if it's a delay because of someone on the other side, someone didn't get their stuff organized, they didn't manage their people correctly, it kind of makes you lose a little bit of interest. Um, so you want to make sure that you make progress. If you don't make progress, have a clear communication on why you're not making progress. For me, also follow-up is important. Just letting me know the progress of things. If I don't hear from people in three months, six months, 12 months, I kind of feel like I'm not that, the project isn't that exciting. I'm not that important. Uh, the board isn't as important. Um, I also want to make sure that the company has picked other key opinion leaders. It's a group that I'm associating with, and I want to make sure that group is top-notch. Um, I, I don't want to be um, thought of in the same light as the other group if the other group if the group isn't uh, maybe up to my standards. You know, I'm I'm in academics. I do research. I lead societies. I'm on the board of several societies. Um, I don't want to be in a group of people that are just worried about money. Uh, I don't want to be in a group of people that are just big users of a company, and that's the only reason why they're on the board. Um, I, I want to be a, a group of like-minded people that can just add to my um, I guess credibility, uh, because if you get associated with the wrong group, it can actually detract from your credibility. Um, and, and you know, one thing is just a lack of awareness of of timing. Um, I, I, I there's a group uh, we're, we're organizing a leadership conference, and they're basically saying, well, you know, we're going to do it on Saturday and Sunday, and it's going to be on both days. And I'm like, well, why not combine it into one day and just be more efficient? Why are you making me do this for two days? And leading up to those two days on the weekend, they've scheduled a practice session right in the middle of my workday when I'm seeing patients and doing surgeries. They just have no awareness of my time or the other people's time. And, and when they have that awareness, they just don't get it. Um, and when they have that lack of awareness, it, it really leads to a lot of other frustrations in so many areas. I'm, I'm sorry I did that one to you, Jeff. I'm joking. But hey, look, Jeff, thanks a lot um, for answering those questions. And again, I hope it's just given some perspective and I'm just going to fill in some of the things that you've mentioned in the rest of the, the, the call. But I've seen, you know, again, you working and I've seen when you get frustrated, et cetera, um, and when you're actually involved in, and really engaged and passionate about something that you're doing. And I think that's what uh, you know, if a company can work with you and people of your ilk, 
it makes a hell of a difference both to you and to, to the company. So thanks, Jeff, for taking the 15 minutes just to give some feedback to the group. And sure. feedback because I'm always learning from you. Speak to you soon. All okay. right. Take care. Thank so you. Jeff Wong. Thanks, right. Jeff. Bye. Yeah, Jeff, I would like to thank you very, very much. Absolutely great insights. Great. Thank you. Have a good okay. day. Thank you. Michael, can I just interrupt for one moment? Because everyone is more than welcome to ask questions on the Mentor Jam uh, network. So if you have questions, please send it to us because, you know, whatever you want to know, we want to know because we would like to interact. So Michael continues, but, um, you know, just, just send your questions and we'll make sure that we'll talk about it. Certainly, please do. Happy to. And even afterwards, I can set if you come into Marion, I can and she sends me the question, I'll fill it out and get back to you. Great. So what should you expect from a KOL? Well, yeah, sell my product. Nah, that's not what we're after uh, from a KOL in real in real terms. But as I've said, is that creating and reinforcing awareness around specific topic areas. So not necessarily selling your product. You don't want the KOL marketing for you, but talking about the specific topic area around your product and you are a solution to that area. Sharing their insights and importantly, where the markets are going. Um, I'd say, I put in red here, engage in your advisory boards and challenging. I've told you about challenging, but when I say engage, too often you get, you get people sitting on a board and they're passive. They're passive. They're just there. It's another board. If that's the case, then you've missed the you've missed the buck. If the person is not actively engaged, constantly challenging you, coming with new ideas, you've got the wrong person or you've got the wrong message. You know, presenting at events and congresses. Again, I try to avoid when I'm working with KLs that they talk about my product. They talk about the clinical area or the the business area that I'm in, and then. I come in with other people to talk about the products that I want. But be accessible. Be accessible is a key criteria. Again, too many senior KOLs, they feel aloof and they're not accessible to your, to your uh, target audience. And ultimately, if you're in this area, I like to use KOLs as independent, unbiased faculty. What should a KOL expect from your company? Well, you know, Jeff mentioned a few things. And I would like to add and clarify, most KOLs, when I've talked to them, and I've talked to hundreds, and I've helped develop whole KOL programs, but they want companies which have a strong and clear game-changing vision. That's what they want. They want the company, obviously, to be honest, transparent, fair. But as Jeff hinted at, please understand their needs and motivations. Present attractive solutions. Also, be careful. Allow the KOL to choose the level of engagement they have with you. Take baby steps. That's what I certainly do. I don't try and go full force into a, an engagement. I try and bring the KOL on board gradually. One of the key elements, access to your executive leadership. But importantly, the big one for me is they are integrated into your decision making. I'm going to come to that. And of course, last but not least, they see that you're prepared to invest, not just in them, but in the area that you're working. So I've talked a little bit about who and what and why the KOL, but one of the fundamental things which I would like to impart on you, impart with you, is the idea of a KOL engagement process. Again, too often I find that people talk about we want a KOL, and they don't really understand why and what they want to do. Yes, they want to influence, etc. But there's so much more that you're missing out. So first of all, try to understand that a KOL can play single or multiple roles in your company and in your in your marketing strategy. What's the role? How do they connect together? Is there a life cycle for the role so that the KOL will evolve with you? But don't just come in with just, I want the KOL to influence and open doors for me. They can do so much more. What Jeff highlighted, here, and here are some KOLs. Again, I, I've used Spine as an example. But please try to understand 
they're intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. KO, you get KOLs, and it, it's the same with any type of engagement, but you get KOLs who want to engage with you because it's a noble purpose. There is a noble purpose behind what you're doing. Of course, there are the KOLs who want to satisfy some form of self-interest. Now, sometimes you're going to look at self-interest as, ah, it's money. But you heard, K, you heard Jeff say, it's not always about the money. It's about other interests that they have. Uncover it, spend time to discover what are those other self-interests that they have. Of course, you want a KL, they want to res earn respect from their peers. So if you position them in the wrong way, and as J Jeff said, he hates, and I know this with him and many other KOLs I've worked with, where companies bring them together with their top users and they call all of the users KOLs. If there's one way to disenfranchise a real KOL is to put him in the same grouping and where he spent a lifetime to develop a academic reputation, uh, studies, etc., and just say, you're the same as these guys who use my product. And finally, one of the key motivators is where they can help build new traditions, new guidelines, new ways of thinking. So please spend time to understand your KOL's motivations, intrinsic motivations, extrinsic motivations. Now, for me, one of the key elements, I'm not sure, I'm hoping, Marianne, can everybody see this? Yes, they can. Okay. One, I apologize, but one of the key elements I would like to do is to actually develop a systematic plan and normally i'm just going to go through this it's five steps for me but a systematic plan again it's not just oh we want a kol and that kol is going to help us open doors first of all i want to spend time to qualify the kol and i want to spend time to understand what alignment do i need with that kol what's the potential alignment i'm going to come to that soon I want to get to know, as I just said, the KOL's needs and motivations fitting to my alignment. Then I want to choose an appropriate engagement strategy. And I talk about three different engagement strategies. There's the investment strategy where I'm just going to invest in this KOL. And, I'll, and that I then tend to do when I'm trying to develop and build a new KOL. But then there are involvement strategies where I work together with the KOL but they do something, I do something, they do something, I do something. And then the third level, the top level, is where I integrate a strategy where I integrate the KOL into my business. And that, when I say integration, I mean real integration, where they don't just sit on an advisory board, but where they actually start to lead projects or they even lead teams inside my company and they take on responsibility. So choose the appropriate engagement strategy for that KOL. Then plan out your engagement process. How am I gonna engage them? When? Somebody like Jeff Wong, if you really wanna engage him, you have to book his time half a year, one year in advance if you really wanna engage the guy. But again, too many people just do ad hoc one-off engagements as opposed to a process and a plan of how I'm going to engage him doing this, this, this in a stepwise moment, movement, sorry. And the final thing is make the KOL engagement permanent. And what I mean by that, and he highlighted it, is make sure your whole company knows who you've engaged, why you've engaged them, and where in the process they are. You just heard when Jeff said, you know, he goes on a, uh, at a Congress and a, uh, and a sales rep doesn't even know who he is. But I see this in KOL management all the time that the company brings in a KOL that they're working with, the KOL walks around the company and talks to people, and they don't know who this person is. But more important, they don't know what is the strategy with this KOL and where that KOL is inside the process of engagement. So those are five systematic steps that I believe you need to think about if you really want to engage a KOL in the right way. The next stage for me, is I like to use semi-quantifiable, uh, qualifiable criteria. So first of all, I create a validity score. And in that, I just use a simple Likert score and I list different elements for me to see, is this a real KOL? 
And you know, I've given an example here, a, a, K, a real KOL for me in the businesses that I'm working at the moment is somebody like Jeff, who's been a president or in a, held a senior office in a, 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 an academic society, somebody who is engaged in developing clinical protocols. And I score this person. How high do they score? The next thing I look at is alignment. I want to look at not just the validity of the KOL, but how aligned are they to my thinking, to my philosophy? Because I want KOLs who believe what I believe. I want KOLs that are aligned to where we're going. So again, I like to create an alignment score based on different parameters. And you can see here, is not mercenary. I don't want people who are just there for the money because they'll never be satisfied. I need people who are, want to engage with us because they have a passion for what we're doing. So I look to try and get a validity score and an alignment score. And from there, I create basically a matrix and I identify where these people are on that matrix. And it allows me to start to prioritize who I'm gonna go with. And importantly, it makes me think about what sort of engagement strategy I'm going to look at. Remember, investment, involvement strategies and integration strategies. Michael, can I ask you one question? Because we have sure. a question, an interesting question that would that's really at the right time now. Because it's a question from Mark Lomax from Pep Health. And his question is, when identifying a KOL, what tips do you have about checking if they are the right one for you and you showed it? But it, 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 it is a difficult, it's sometimes difficult. What is your advice? What are tips? Okay. That's, a, that's an absolutely great question. So I've gone through my validity and my alignment and I've started to prioritize. Now, when I've picked the priority and the priority list that I'm after, I actually now create review session, uh, uh, sessions and focus groups with my client base to see if that my client base recognizes this person in full. So I actually do a double check. So I've done, and I must say, I didn't put that in the graphic, so I, it's, it's a great question to ask. But actually I spend time in different countries if I'm doing a global thing or if I'm only working as you were talking about in the United States, I will actually run focus groups with different levels of my target audience. I, I'm not just going to ask them about KOLs and if Jeff Wong is a KOL or what do they think of him. I, it, it's a focus group about other subject areas. But during that process, I validate does this person tick the boxes with my target audience? That's what I do, basically, Marian. Great question, okay? So coming back, what I try to do after I've done my prioritization, and yes, I validated with my target audience that this person is recognized, is trusted, is believable, is not, you know, I, I'm dealing with a company at the moment, and I, I can say, honestly, they are doing a research project with a particular person, and I was stunned why they would choose this particular person because in the marketplace this person is known as a mercenary he is actually just there for the money and because they've never gone through this process they've actually picked somebody who in the end even if he does a good clinical research study will not be believable because this is a person who just sells himself to the highest bidder Everything that you do with them, it's like doing your own clinical study and expecting your market to believe the results that come out of your own company. A total waste of money. So remember that one. Coming back, where I've got an existing KOL, I look to build what I call is a personal engagement plan. And again, what I'm saying is I clearly define the engagement goals. I start by initiating a consultation, not trying to engage them. I have long talks with them about, I'm trying to validate their alignment with me. I've said before, anticipate their needs. And when I talk about becoming an opportunity creator, you know, Jeff is a senior guy in his profession, but there are still new opportunities for him that he can engage with. And when I can identify that and become an opportunity creator for him as part of his personalized engagement, um, then 
actually, I'm on a win. I want to make sure that I embrace the KOL's feedback. Now, I'm not going to do everything the KOL says, but I'm going to embrace what he says. And even when I don't do what they're recommending, I go back to them and I explain why we're not doing their idea. There's nothing worse than if a KOL is spending time to give you information or ideas and you do nothing with it, but importantly, you never tell them that you're not going to do something with it because then they just think you don't care. Do less, but do the crucial things. And remember, with most KOLs, high level of scientific content is everything. They love the science. They're there because of science. Now, actually, what is even more exciting for me, and I've spent a lot of time doing it, is actually creating KOLs. That's so much fun. It's not just going to an existing KOL like Jeff Wong, but actually identifying people who I can actually create. And it takes me a bit more time, but done in the right way. I have a KOL and a relationship for life. So when I'm looking to build a new KOL, I'm going to spend a lot more on the qualification process. I really want to see that this potential KOL is really aligned because I'm going to be doing a lot of investment strategy on this person. I'm going to perform a gap analysis to identify that KOL's personal competency gaps. And then I'm going to create a development plan, a personal development plan that reduces those competency gaps because I'm going to help build this person's career over the next three, five years. And we are going to have this very close and deep relationship. And then I'm going to start putting together activities that support his repositioning or their repositioning. In other words, I'm going to get them in at special congresses. I'm going to do work with them on clinical research, get them in as reviewers in journals and, uh, and congress, and get them on academic boards. Because that way, I'm promoting this, uh, my KOL's career, and he's stepping out from the crowd so that we can move forward together. It's a, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship in this case. So creating, you can create KOLs. It takes a bit longer, but the reward can be phenomenal. So the last part of my talk, I just want to outline a couple of classic errors that we make when managing KOLs. And there are a number of errors that we can make, a number of essential don'ts. This is not a complete list, but please don't view a KOL by the use of your product. That's not a KOL. That doesn't automatically make that person a KOL. Don't, uh, don't expect the KOL to market you or your product. That's not what they're there for. Quite the opposite. They should be challenging. They should be skeptical in front of the public, but they should be skeptical in a way that you brings out the best solution from you. Make, don't make entry into the relationship difficult. You know, I was working with a company re uh, recently and their contract was 48 pages long. 48 pages long of small print. If there's one way to turn off somebody, give them a contract like that. As I would say, of course, a KOL is looking for some sort of financial reward or some sort of reward. But don't offer financial incentives or special privileges too soon. Make them work for it. That's, it's a challenge as well for them. But don't come in with the money first. That is by far the wrong thing. Use terminology that fits to their uh, aspiration. Don't put them on a pedestal. You want a partner, not a god. Don't overwhelm them and expect them to do too much. Another major don't. But the final one, and I think Jeff mentioned it, don't waste their time. You don't mean to do it, but we often do. We waste their time. And a KOL, if they're a real KOL, they have no time. The biggest respect that you can have is make sure every engagement with them brings them value and you value, and you don't waste their time. So in summary, team, I'd just like to say a quick take-home message. Engaging and building legitimate KOLs is a critical success factor. You have to do it. But clearly define the role and the type of KOL you need. Spend some time doing that. Not 
one size fits all. Understand the intrinsic and extrinsic motivators that your KOL will have, and then validate it as per the questionnaire. Question. Create a systematic process of engagement. Go through that process. Don't just jump to one thing. Think about an engagement plan over a period of time, bringing in more elements that the KOL can do. Don't throw everything at once. But finally, um, members, please don't fall into any of those classic traps in KOL and management. Trying to sell them, act as gods, and expect them to be marketing for you. So on that, Marianne, and I hope that was of some use to you just to give you a background of the hundreds of KOL successes. And I've got to say failures that I've learned on how to deal with this special group of uh, potential customers, but not always a customer that helps you fast track your organization in the United States market. Yeah, Michael, this is, this is extremely valuable. The information you gave, because all of us, all the companies that are in the event are in that stage of either building their KOL <clears throat> relationship or they have KOLs. And honestly, if I look back at my, you know, how I, 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 I start up companies, we all have a tendency to think, Hey, I know that person. That person is in my field. We go for it, right? And, and, and that's what we often do. And what I really appreciate, and I know how good you are at your profession, but I think this is something we can all learn. It's all about a KOL strategy. And I think you gave us some very, very good tools to get started. It's not just one person you know or met but it's a real strategy, right? Absolutely, it's really identifying the roles that you need and not going for friends or people that you ha right. happen to know, but actually pinpoint what you really need and then identify the people that you wanna work with and put them through this systematic plan. Absolutely right, Marion. And I tell yeah, you, when I you do that, the results are amazing. Right, and I think that was already, you know, one of the questions hinting to it, but I, I know it's in the mind of many people. So the second step that you basically mentioned, and that's something we all underestimate, is the investment strategy, basically, in your KOLs, right? Yeah. Um, it's not just, I, I really appreciate what you were saying, that actually you're building that career of your KOL. So it's not just, uh, let's, you know, be in use contact them, use, with them. Use them. No, you have a three stra engagement strategies, investment, involvement, integration. You have, to, especially with a young potential who, as you heard Jeff say, there are people at different levels of their career. You've got to be prepared to invest because you will reap the benefit, but invest in the right way so that you're moving that KOL up through their career, as opposed to the, going in for a top guy at the beginning uh, as somebody like a Jeff Wong, who's got a worldwide reputation, in this case, in spine surgery, there isn't, a, I don't think there are spine surgeons in the world that have not heard of Jeff Wong. He's at the top end. So you may have a different strategy for him, but it all, it, it's all about investment at the beginning. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And we, we have a question which is related to this. And the question is, um, basically what Jeffrey Wong was saying, building your reputation in the US market. That's extremely important. But can you use an agent to represent you as a startup to find KOLs or is there a risk? How, how would you perceive it? Because I know you always put a lot of energy in it yourself. I know how dedicated you are, but would you hire an agent? And, and if you would, who, you know, what to look for, basically. I, I have got to say is that, and I love the question, but I've never done that. No. I, I've got no experience in trying to hire an agent because for me and my companies that I act on behalf of, um, the whole goal is to have this very personal contact between 
the KOL and the company, not the KOL and an individual. Again, that's a big mistake that companies make. They, they have one individual who deals with the KOL. Hey, and guess what? That KOL becomes loyal to that individual. That's great until the individual perhaps leads your company and the KOL goes with them because their loyalty is there. So actually, I have to say, I've never used an agent to do that side. So I can't really comment, Marianne, because for me, yeah. When I'm working with KOLs, I want to work with me and my company, not me, uh, the, my client company. I want to engage the KOL with multiple levels in the company and not just one person. Because if the KOL is just related to one person in, in the company, even the CEO, uh, it's, a, it's a risk. There's always a risk. You want the KOL engaged with the company in general at multiple levels. So I have to say, I can't answer that question. I do apologize because I've, Michael, never done, you, I've never used an agent. I you would, are, I you are. I would never use an agent. So there you go, Michael. You're in fact answering the question, you know, <laughs> of the yes, risk. I'm and... I <laughs> you know, even, even Marion, when I'm working, when I'm working with clients to help them build their KOL management and their KOL engagement strategies, you know, it's not about me. It's, it's going through this very, very formulae, a formal process, systematic plan, and making sure that the KOL that we've identified, we've validated, we've aligned, we've revaluated, validated, we've created an engagement or a development plan for them. But I always make sure that the bond is with multiple levels in the company. I've never gone through an agent. I, I like it. And I think you're, that, that's exactly how it, how it should be. So the answer is also basically, you know, it, it's great if it's your first time or even, you know, we'll, we'll keep on learning, you know. So to get someone like you or someone with lots of KOL experience on board, but the company, the CEO and all these different levels in the company have to do the job. Uh, yeah. Because with an agent, you're, it's, it's to, you know, the, the, the risk is to make. I have another question and time uh, is... I, I, I would just say that if you, yeah. do, you, if you do find an agent or a consultant or whatever, and you notice that the consultant is building the relationship, terminate them. Because that's not what you want. It's a, it's a, you know, the relationship is between the KOL and your company. And remember, it's not just the KOL. I, you know, there's a whole set of communities that you build, and I didn't have time to talk about that today, but you build communities around that KOL because you want to manage the diffusion. Sorry, you're about to ask another question, Mary. Yeah, there, we have a couple of questions coming up. So the, um, the question is, what is the best moment to hire uh, our KOL board in the development of, of the company? And the question is from Julien Payen. I, I, I get to say, the best moment you know, I always try, I always recommend to my clients to bring on board three, four KOLs as soon as possible, as soon as possible, at the earliest stage, to start the, the messaging, to start the building the relationship. It's never too early. Now, again, one of the things I strictly do is make sure I never pay, I, never, I make sure my clients never pay KOLs financially, okay, right up front, never. And there's a way, you know, it's building that relationship. So I, I have to say too often people wait to build the KOL relationship and the communities at far too late in the day. They wait till their product um, is in development or is coming through development. And that's when they say they want the KOL. Nowadays, these guys and the market is getting tougher and tougher. You so need Michael, a longer yeah. period of time to build those relationships and get in the market. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. It's it's absolutely interesting. But I see the time running, and I have yes, two more exactly. questions. All right. Okay. And I just want to make sure that that all the questions will be asked. There's one question. I think a very interesting one as well. How? does or did the COVID-19 impact KOL strategy? Because, you know, it's Zoom now and it's different. What is your, what's your opinion? How do you do it? I mean, especially when you're building it, right? Yeah, 
Now, again, I think the, it, it is a very good question. And just in, in simple terms, everybody's in the same boat. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, Jeff Wong and people like that a few years ago would never think of doing Zoom calls. Now it's the, the de facto standard. It hasn't altered any of the plans and the work that I've done at all. Um, actually, it's lowered the cost of talking with people because now I don't need to necessarily visit them all the time. They accept that we're going to do it with Zoom. If it's done correctly and managed, and again, it's all about the communication with these people and booking their time well in advance. Um, it makes it certainly up till now, Marion, it's made no difference with the three or four companies that I'm working on at the moment and helping them with their KOL strategy. Quite the well, opposite, it's lowered the costs. Well, that is a relief uh, to, to know because it, you're right, we're all in there. So we're all in the same boat. Everybody, everybody's doing the same now. And again, five years ago, three years ago, you would have said, ah, it can never work. Actually, it's working and it's not going to change that much. Right. It's not going to go back to norm. The days where you flew everywhere to meet people, right. it's, you know, it's proven now that we can do a lot with a well constructed Zoom call. Um, with All your right. camera. Okay. Well, Michael, I'm 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 really sorry because there there was another question, but we have to be very strict in time, you know. No problem. I wish you all the best, Marianne, yes. and I wish the team and good luck to you all in whatever your ventures are in the United States. It's an amazing market. It's a tough market to get into. You've got to start earlier, and you, as I heard in your previous talk, perseverance, perseverance, perseverance. All Thanks right. a lot. Perfect. Michael, thank you so much. And, okay. you know, this is not for everyone because there are lots of questions. This is not the end of a discussion. Uh, this is a start. And, of course, with Global Skill, we come back with companies and we'll meet uh, Michael uh, again, oh. you know. So, if anybody, uh, if anybody drop, Marianne, if anybody drops you a particular question or whatever and you want to forward it to me, I'm happy to answer if I can. Okay? Perfect. Thank you so okay. much, Michael. Thank you. Good, guys. Good luck. All right, thanks. Bye. So, we are going to um, close this session. Um, I would like to, to thank, before we, we move on with the rest of the program, all our partners, because this could not uh, be done without, uh, I would say, a lot of business friends in the field who are always willing again to, uh, to get in contact with, with the startup companies and bring in all their expertise. So. First of all, again, Health Holland. Uh, Health Holland is a very important partner. Of course, the consulate, but I would also like to mention all the other partners at UCI, the partners ACA, GPAC, Arizona. I also would like to mention specifically all our friends in San Diego. They, the program didn't allow to put a lot of time and spend a lot of time with them, but San Diego, all our partners, I would like to thank. I would like to thank Loyens and Louf and also EY and McKinsey because they are very loyal partners to, to us. So what's going to happen now? We are going to move on to another, um, I would say, Zoom. Uh, it's called, um, yeah, it's, it's, we're actually we're going on a Zoom account, but for safety, I will ask you all to go to the Mentor Jam Network so at the Mentor Jam Network, you will see, uh, you know, the, the next Zoom link where you can click on. Um, but we can put it out here uh, for safety reasons. So please go back to the Mentor Jam Network. We do have a, uh, a short break of five minutes. And uh, well, actually, it's two minutes now. <laughs> so a uh, quick, quick break. And we are back at nine with Arizona. So this is a really quick flight to Arizona. See you all in a little bit. <laughs> 